What's happening, Fish and Friends? If you're like me, you look forward to watching some MLF on the weekends. I personally think it's great for the sport of bass fishing. It's allowed the anglers who fish in the tournaments a great opportunity. Now, on top of that, it's reaching everyday folks like me and other people that love bass fishing. I think I watch it on the Outdoor Channel or Network or whatever it is. But more importantly, it's reaching people that are brand new to the sport. People that are just getting into it, seeing it on primetime TV as they're flipping through and like, Oh, this is kind of cool. Why is there a timer? What's going on here? I know some people argue, I want to see big fish caught, right? I want to see guys go out and catch the five biggest fish that they can. And I get it. I completely understand that. Fishing is different for everyone. And there's people that are always in the pursuit of that big, huge bass. I completely understand. I like MLF because it's relatable. It reminds me of the old days when I was out with my buddies. Or whenever I go out with my old man, we always have friendly competitions, right? It's not just, uh, I'm catching. You know, you and your buddy are always going back and forth. Who's caught more today? Or... Sometimes we'll have little tournaments like that. Okay, let's see who weighs in the most fish or let's see who can get first to 20, you know, whatever, something fun. To me, that sort of fun competition is what makes fishing enjoyable when you go out with friends. You know, I didn't grow up on an expensive bass boat with a bunch of crazy electronics. Good Lord. And don't get me wrong, I would love to do that. I would love the opportunity to go out with guys and fish, you know, those really deep, clear lakes, you know, fishing 30, 40 feet drop shots. Can't believe I just said that on camera, but you know, things like that, things that I don't get to do, a lot of offshore fishing is something I'm not strong at and I want to get better at those things. So hold on, I know you're thinking, wait a minute, Debo, I thought this was an MLF recap. Well, I'm not just going to recap the MLF rounds, you know, the elimination rounds, whatever it is from the previous week, but I will warn you, there will be spoilers. So this is your chance to turn away. There will be MLF spoilers. If you haven't watched, turn away. So this series will be about picking a couple things from the show, you know, every week or every couple weeks I'll do these. We'll pick some stuff from the show to talk about. There are things that even the beginner angler can learn from watching these guys on TV. I have people comment all the time. Hey, Debo, you know, we like watching you fish from the bank. I don't have all those crazy, you know, boats and electronics, expensive stuff. You know, you're just doing some regular guy fishing. But don't be fooled. Watching those guys, even though they're in an expensive bass boat, there's still a lot you can learn. See, that challenge is what keeps me coming back. I love going out there having to figure the fish out. Every time you go out, it's not the same. Okay, what's the water going to be like? What's the temperature? Is there a shad spawn or bluegill spawn going on? Every time you're trying to solve a little mini puzzle, and that's what gets me addicted to bass fishing. So after watching the first three weeks of elimination rounds, the first thing that I wanted to bring attention to was the art of the follow-up. The most recent episode on TV was the round three elimination round that Cody Meyer won, and the first fish that he caught was a giant six-pounder. He was throwing a buzz frog in there, reeling it in, and a giant waked on it. He's like, oh, right away, reeled it in, put it down, and goes to his spinning combo. He had a Strike King shimmy stick on there, wacky rigged, green pumpkin on six pound fluorocarbon, throws that in there and almost as soon as it hits, he gets it. That was the biggest fish of the day caught on a wacky rigged follow up bait, right? He missed it on the buzz bait instead of throwing in there and you know maybe spooking the fish or missing a cast, he throws right in with his confidence bait and hooks that fish. Same thing happened with Jay Lee. He was in working pads using a frog, had a fish, saw it up there, throws a, I believe it was a Texas rig striking rage bug, you know, something similar like that, a Texas rig, throws it in there and gets that fish on a follow-up. The third gentleman that put that to use last week was James Watson. And talk about a funny guy. That dude is fun to watch. He was riding a struggle bus out there, right? He couldn't get a single scoreable fish. Finally, he gets one. He's coming up the bank. I think he was throwing a swim jig maybe. Sees a fish, you know, a good looking fish, puts it down, goes this spinning rod. I think he might have had a wacky rig on there too. Throws it in and hooks that smallmouth. And that was his only scorable fish of the day on a follow-up bait. Now, this is something that I do all the time when I'm frog fishing, right? You throw a frog in there, you get a big blow up, and instinct, you jerk it out, you know, and it misses it. Oh, oh, and he missed I missed him. What do you do if you miss one on a frog? What's the first thing you do? Pitch in the stinko. You can go back in with that frog and a lot of times you'll get it. You know, you slow down right at that you know blow up spot where that fish is at and a lot of times you'll get them. However, I feel you are more successful if you have a big open spot or you know, you've got a spot where you can accurately hit exactly where you saw that fish at. Throwing a six inch stick bait is what I go to because I'm normally catching a bigger than average fish on a frog, right? Or you can go with a jig, you know, if it's not too scummy. Or you can go with a Texas rig, but some sort of follow-up bait like that when you get a miss. You see guys do the same thing with large swim baits, right? I'm not a proficient large swim bait fisherman, something I want to get into next year, but they're doing the same thing. They're using that large swim bait. They might not necessarily get the bite or the fish, but if you can get a, you know, a bass that's instinctively coming out to look at that from behind a big log and it goes right back in there as you roll that big swim bait by, you can go grab a, something like that, a little finesse jig. Or if it was my old man, I know he's going to be grabbing the old tequila sunrise worm. Whatever your confidence follow-up bait is, 
you know exactly where that fish is at. You just gotta throw something into it, but you have to be quick. Now the follow-up does require you to carry a few combos with you. I'm a huge advocate of it. Whenever I go out, I've got three, four combos with me as I'm walking the bank because if you're a guy that takes one combo out, there is nothing wrong with that. You only need one combo to go out and have fun, but I've seen it too many times where a guy will walk up a good stretch of bank, his favorite, you know, good prime real estate, Throwing a spinnerbait doesn't get a single bite, right? And goes, nah, the fish aren't biting today and rolls out. I have been guilty of this. I go up a bank, I don't get a bite. I'm like, man, overcast day, the spinnerbait, they're shedding this lake. Like, why aren't they biting it? I go back over that exact same stretch of bank with a lipless or a swim jig, something just a little bit different. And it can be completely different results. So again, the importance of putting that follow bait right on top of that fish. So it just reacts. It's not thinking about it is important. Moving on to the second thing I noticed. If you go back to elimination round two, Justin Lucas, goose egg, zero scorable fish. Elimination round three, we had two different guys that didn't get a single scorable fish. Guys that couldn't catch one one pound bass. Now, a lot of people new to the sport watching might say, gosh, these guys must be awful. They couldn't be farther from the truth. These guys are hammers. You don't get to MLF, you know, bass elites. You don't get to those by just being some guy that signs up and, oh, okay, I'm gonna fish them. These guys have a ton of years and experience and they're good, they're good anglers. These guys are thousands of times better than I am, you know, but I go out and goose egg. Well, Cody Meyer summed it up completely and I was like, my jaw dropped. I'm like, yes, this is awesome. After his win in the press conference, he said, I like fishing when it's tough. That's the second biggest thing that I learned from watching MLF these past few weeks is, if you fish enough, sometimes it's gonna be hard. You're gonna goose egg, you're gonna skunk. Now for beginners, you know, people just starting this, this should be encouraging. And I know they're probably thinking the opposite, like I'm not very good. If those guys can't catch it, I'm never gonna catch fish. That's the wrong attitude to have. It should be encouraging. If you're looking and saying, yeah, okay, fishing is hard. It's not easy. You can't just go out and catch fish every single time. If these pros are struggling, then I'm okay with it. If I have a bad day and catch one fish or I skunk and don't catch any, fine. But the thing is you have to have that right mind frame. Like Cody said, you have to be willing to go out when it's tough. You have to embrace that grind. I hear a lot of guys that'll only go out, oh, it's an overcast day, it looks like it's a good good day, I'm gonna go out and hit some fishing, or you know, pre-front's moving and fishing's supposed to be really good, I think I'll try it tonight. Well, if you're only willing to go out on those days, you're not gonna improve. You know, the days where it's a bluebird sky, 85, I think they were fishing around through 85, 87 degree water temp, like that's hot. If you really wanna improve, those are the days that you need to go out, the good days, the bad days, and everything in between. Now to me, fishing is like anything else. The more you want to improve, the more time you put into it, and the more effort you put forth, the quicker you're going to see results and the quicker you're going to grow with that. Now, this is something that's really hit home for me because I've really been trying to focus on one or two baits every year. Four or five years ago, I started throwing a lipless again. I threw it, you know, every now and then I had decent success, but I really hammered it in the spring and in the fall. I was really, really throwing that lipless. You know, you hear guys throw on it, but I, I just didn't have confidence. Same thing for the past few years with the swim jig. I only used to throw that in real clear situations. Otherwise, I was going to a chatterbait. That was kind of my deal, but I really made a point to fish that swim jig. And the results spoke for themselves. I put in enough time. I always had a swim jig tied on, and that actually became the second best producing moving bait for me this year. Now, when I'm talking about putting in time with it, I'm talking about putting in time. Every time you go out, have one tied on and work something that you're not confident with. Not go out one day a week and try for 30 minutes and not get any bites and go, oh, this thing stinks. Talking about pounding, no matter what lake you're on, get after it. So often I see people go out armed with their confidence right away, straight out of the gate, throwing it. And if they don't start getting baits on their confidence bait, let's say it's a wacky rig stick bait, there's days that fish don't want to hit a stick bait, right? You need to make them react. So they go out and they're throwing that stick bait and they're not getting a bite and they're already thinking, oh my gosh, today's going to be awful, right? I've already thrown the best thing I have. They always eat that. They're not eating today, then I'm not catching fish. Fishing for a lot of us, unless you really subconsciously force yourself to try new things, Follows the 90-10 rule, 90% 90 of the time, you're only fishing about 10% of your tackle, right? So you have to make that conscious effort to say, okay, I wanna get better with these things. For me, drop shot and swim baits. Those are the two things I'm gonna throw. Am I gonna skunk this year if I only go out with those two? Yeah, not confident with them. I'm still trying to learn exactly where to fish them, how to fish them. But you have to be willing to accept that. You have to be willing to accept if you put in time with something that you don't know, you're not gonna be good at it first, right? You're gonna skunk. That second biggest thing I learned, don't be afraid of tough conditions. You're gonna struggle. You might not even catch any fish at all, right? But that's all right, you pack up and you move on to the next day, just like the pros do. They shut the door on that one and move on to the next tour. So comment below, fish and friends. Let me know, do you like the MLF format? Have there been things that you've watched, noticed, and learned along the way? Let me know in the comments below. I'm interested to hear. I'll do another one of these episodes in a couple weeks. So as you're watching the MLF on the weekends, try to keep ingraining your mind, okay, what little things can I pick up on? Not a bunch, just maybe one or two little things as you watch. We'll talk about those. But that's it. It is late. I got to get to bed. I hope you all enjoyed. So of course, until next time.